Um, so guys, we have uh, Advocate Geeta Rama session with us. I'm sure. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence, for being here to have this conversation with us. So we are going to talk about things that are uh, usually considered to be talked about, you know, too much uh, feminism and equality and how gender basically plays with other aspects of life this time we are going to talk majorly about how law interacts with gender and what Geeta ma'am's journey has been like I will give you a brief introduction shortly she has over 39 years of experience as a litigator in Madras High Court and um, she has stood her ground and basically just inspired so many so many across the country i mean just a just a random google search will tell you all about her uh before we start introducing her uh, officially and beginning with today's session uh i would just hand over the mic to sonali to tell you guys just exactly why even though everybody thinks that this conversation you know it's not really required that much uh why we chose to have it today so over to you sonali those who might ask what such dialogues or webinars about feminism will do. How can repeating anecdotes of their personal experience change the way women inhabit the world? I will ask them to read Human Condition by Hannah Arendt. With word and deed, we insert ourselves into the human world. And this insertion is like in which we confirm and take upon ourselves the naked fact of our original physical appearance. Taking from Arendt, through such discussions and by speaking and enunciating our experiences, we are making ourselves felt in the world. By the means of speech, we are expressing. And by the means of this webinar, we are acting. Thank you so much, Sonali. I hope that gives you a sense of why we are here today. We would just like to introduce you all to Geeta Ma'am now, Geeta Ramasajan Ma'am. Ma she's an advocate at Madras High Court a Chennai-based lawyer with more than, with about 39 years of experience, both at the trial courts and Madras High Court. She's a champion for women and child rights. She is known for liberating feminist views with her trailblazing personality. Advocate Rama Sation started her practice somewhere in the early 1980s. Among the many achievements and professional successes she's had, it will be unfair to bind her just within a few. Just to touch upon it a little bit, she served as a special prosecutor for the Central Bureau of Investigation, as well as a counsel for the National Commission for Protection of Child's Rights. She has also been a consultant to the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund and United Nations Development Program. We did a little bit of digging to tell you um, just exactly what was Geeta Ma'am's first introduction to the legal field and uh, we would love for her to expand on that elaborate on that and share her experiences with us just in a bit um sunali would just tell you uh, a little bit about her childhood yeah so i had to do i had to go to some because i never gave you any information <laughs> <laughs> so geeta Ma'am had her first advent with law and the legal profession in her own house since her uh, grandfather was a lawyer in uh, mannar guddi she interest in the legal profession while she was still young, from reading fiction to now reading statutes, from then to now, Geeta Ma'am has completed more than 39 years in the legal profession, inspiring many women and those who associate with the gender. And I don't know, I mean, it's just beyond us to have you. Yeah, we are fangirling right now, <laughs> completely. My pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am and her contributions to law and in court are beyond her years in the profession. It can't be quantified. These years can only be suggestive of her emancipatory work in the legal field. We can only be thankful to Zoom that in, in these times of you know capitalism, at least, we are getting to spend this Sunday evening with all of you together, no matter where we come from what we must we might be doing right now and whatever our constraints or our struggles or experiences have been we have been able to connect through zoom so yeah something good has come of it and at the time when many are championing formal equality we've gathered here to discuss inequalities that exist despite everything seemingly equal we're here to discuss the women in court 
not only as lawyers or judges, but also victims, witnesses, ahmads, and gendered bodies. Geeta Ma'am is here, here to help us understand the complexities of how law imagines women speaking from her own experiences. So, without further ado, I will just hand over the stage to you, Geeta Ma'am, for getting to know um, our <laughs> and to share I your. I didn't give you any information, but see the. It, uh, if I just start a little bit about myself, is that though my grandfather was a lawyer, uh, I didn't have an inheritance of practice because by the time I started it, he was too old and he had uh, almost, you know, left. So in that sense, my practice was in self-made, you know. And uh, I also grew up in uh, undivided Bihar in the state of, in the district of Dhanbad the coal mines. Yeah. Now it is part of Jharkhand. So my earlier childhood was Calcutta and then in Dhanbad, where my entire schooling was done. So to a large extent, it was north, south, everything. And uh, I'm glad that you, um, Sanya, spoke about formal equality because understanding formal protectionist and substantive equality actually gives us a clarity about our profession when we actually start on to address our cases yeah and um, so then uh, what you which you the 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 idea of these three equality actually comes in the cedar model but in our, some of our recent judgments of the supreme court especially in the sabri mala case this the concept of equality has come into the judgment in terms of addressing the issue of discrimination. That's a that's a aside because you want anecdotal uh, discussions. Yeah. And I also actually want to share one interesting case with you. Uh, if you remember the latest striking down of 497 adultery, which the Supreme Court has uh, struck down as being discriminatory, there were earlier two cases. One was Somitri Vishnu versus Union of India and the other was Revati versus Union of India. Now, Revati, both these women are actually from Chennai and um, uh, Revati, I mean, I know both of them, but Revati's case, I actually argued in the Supreme Court wow. in terms of discrimination in CRPC and you find that reported in uh, um, SCC 1988 you know? and of course at that time the court did not look at it as discrimination at all because I think the notion of that was the I think the judges both in Somitri and in Revati were more looking at the provision from a protectionist point of view whereas now the striking down has been though it was such a on your face discrimination but now, of course, after 88 to 2019, the judgment of the Supreme Court has struck down the provision. So I'm very happy that I'm seeing it when I'm practicing also. Having said that, when you are asking me about not just women, but victims, uh, but women who come to the legal system, not victims, of course. We think of them as survivors. Now, women, more often than not, um, except in... Or for that matter, maybe all litigants, but women are actually drawn to the system on their own. It's not as if they really want to come to the legal system, but they are forced to come into the legal system if they are uh, survivors of crime or if they are caught up in violence or if they are caught up in a bad marriage or in service matters, you know, if they really see discrimination. So while both men and women don't choose to come to the legal system, in the context of women, the, um, the, the processes and the cases that actually affect them are far more. If you look at sexual offenses, if you look at offenses against women. So uh, when they come to the system, um, you know how uh, I think everybody is so tired, you know, um, Everybody is so fed up of the delays that to me, the greatest uh, difficulty I have even today is when the person comes even now and asks me 
will I get justice? How long will my case take? I really have no answer to these two questions in any way. And so then you, you have to say, you know, we'll see, we'll use this litigation. And today, at every point of time, I would say a litigation is a strategic tool. We will use this as a strategic tool for negotiation. Uh, and of course, uh, sometimes when you file a litigation, it does take a momentum of its own. And I'll tell them that maybe we can resolve it in a faster way. Now, as far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, uh, litigations probably don't take that long as it does in some other parts of the country. Uh, you know, so uh, maybe a, a contested litigation, a contested matrimonial case, unless there are stays at various stage, you know, stay by the High Court or stay by the Supreme Court, uh, may maximum take a period of three years, which I think is not true of many other states where the litigation can go for a longer period of time. So you first have to two aspects, I think, if you are actually looking at access to justice. One is the actual physical process of access, you know. Uh, a woman wants to file a case, let's say. Let's take the most common example of a woman wanting to file a maintenance case in rural India. Now, by our customary practices, when the woman marries, she moves away from her natal home to that of her husband's home. Which means in that area, in that uh, place, she really will not have any external support system. Forget the fact that parents also don't support her. That's a different issue. But if you're actually looking at her movement, there will not be much of a support system for her to address a problem. So she will necessarily be, you know, either forced to go back to her natal home or, you know, um, because she really cannot file or litigate staying in her husband's home. Whatever the DV Act may say, whatever rights the Domestic Violence Act may give of your right to reside in the household, it's very hard to uh, for anyone to actually accept that, sit in the house day in and day out and fight. You know, uh, very few people can actually, nobody would actually want to do that. So then that is your access to justice. Then what happens then is that your physical access. Let's say you go back to your parents' house. 125 CRPC says you can file. Even DV says you can file from where you reside. Go back to your and also all the matrimonial laws. You can go back to your parents' house. Going to the court. Um, the transport. The distance. And if you are, let's say, a wage earner, agricultural worker, you're going to lose your full one-day wage. So there is a lack of physical access. And once you reach there in the legal system, what happens? Your uh, The language of law is very different. The language of law can be in a foreign language like English. Even if it is in the same language, the language is complex. And how do you then look at this whole way where, you know, everybody is so new and it, it it does cause a lot of problems and finally then the whole delay which uh, just tires you out more than anything else which Justice Murli there had actually referred this in a case calling it as litigation psychosis parties get what is called as litigation psychosis so this is a major hurdle whatever be the litigation Whatever be the uh, cutting across all intersection in terms of gender. Yeah, absolutely, ma'am. You spoke yes. of uh, uh, you know domestic violence, and we were thinking of asking this question from you that uh, because domestic violence lies somewhere between you know, in the limbo. In civil, between the yeah. limbo, it is. Uh, civil remedies, but you have to go to criminal courts. And uh, could you throw some light on the same and uh, how difficult it is in terms of in when it comes to praxis, in terms of what is written and what is happening? How do you see probably a change 
also in the way the women uh, tackle with all these things i would just like to add that i had read this article by pooja satyogi where she visited the special cell units in delhi to understand uh, how women you know registered complaints so she this she sort sort of saw that how the uh, constables there were helping women to register complaints in a way that it shows that the marriage is brutal enough for the woman to get rid of the husband so if you could throw line in both these terms and how they engage with the legal world and the legal system through that do remedy such a thing see one uh, one aspect about the domestic violence is that uh, yes now it's made uh, things it is a very very progressive law but as you say the difference between the de jure that is the language of the law and the de facto position which is what is the ground reality is there is no comparison in india of any law now uh, when you go i in my experience because now living in a urban city and in a state where there is some greater awareness let me put it in larger support systems comparatively uh, when you go to the protection officer the complaints are generally given in the protection officers now the police even when you go and give a complaint very rarely do they refer it like that you know they hear they kind of they just seem to think that uh, if it is domestic violence you can go to the court now so for the police it is unless it's 498a you know other laws don't make any sense to them so even if the protection officer were to a direct even when the act says that any any uh, if uh, not withstanding anything under the law the police should also investigate and if the protection officer were to direct investigation very you will not find that unless they want to bring it within the umbrella of 498a okay which has its own problems so uh, if i have uh, i would love to study pooja's uh, you know pooja's report as to what she says about that we i have not come across faulty representations in db complaints okay but it's very very uh, sketchy at times you know people think that it doesn't have to be in great detail but actually it ought to be in detail because the form itself is huge you know uh it requires you to fill up so many other so many aspects of uh, uh what has happened to you so people generally give it as a representation technically a representation should also be treated as domestic violence but uh that representation the first representation that goes may also give room for the husband to say that this is technically not viable the violence is not correct etc and that is where then you may be asked to write it in such a way that it will help the respondent and not the woman so that's the whole issue with dv and there is a lot of delay anyway dv does not finish in the time stipulated under the law it does take its own time and one difficulty i feel with the dv is that uh, though it is in the magistrate court and though the reliefs are all civil the magistrate is overburdened with all other kinds of cases you know with other criminal cases that come before him so i think the time spent sometimes on dv is a tendency to postpone it and see whether it can get resolved by itself through the intervention of lawyers because you know the moment you file dv the other spouse is going to go and file a petition for divorce you know on the ground therefore in that in that litigation maybe i think the magistrate sometimes feel there is greater scope for negotiation right so that even it can be multiple proceedings i think even pooja satyogi ma'am was also like dr pooja satyogi was also referring to the same thing that how the you know the complaints are to be detailed out in a way that they make a case for the woman who's coming and most of them either are quote and quote illiterate or come from a very uh, maybe uh, socially weaker backgrounds 
so to and it's also i think the gradation is so much like we are graded citizens already now you add women to that and then you add dalit to that and then you add any other else economic uh, weaker section to that then gradation becomes uh, multifold thank you tanya would you like to ask any question yeah i just um, i was thinking about the concept of settlement and uh, we had this question that the idea of settlement it's often raised and women are somehow subjected to a reasoning of compromise by the family or society so does the state reinforce the similar condition of compromise on the woman if so in doing so does the state act as the patriarchal family by reinforcing similar norms when it comes to the concept of settlement no matrimonial litigation are you talking about yes. right see i think two issues happen one is the sheer delay forces people to settle matters okay. nobody wants to keep coming for so many years na no? would like a matter to be adjudicated fast secondly i think in all systems of law across the world uh, a kind of a settlement is encouraged rather than go around and to litigate now in our system the personal laws except islamic law are all uh, based on the fault finding theory unless it's mutual consent you have to prove a matrimonial wrong so you have to prove cruelty if you prove cruelty you need evidence now what kind of evidence then a letter written in a fit of anger can also become a weapon on the other side to say this is how she or he talks to me so then this whole evidentiary process makes it much more complex so at certain stages then i think uh, um, women feel that the matter can be settled most in my experience i find at the stage of cross examination a lot of cases get settled now with the latest judgment of the supreme court which came in november which has said that everybody must declare their affidavit of assets uh, men are willing to settle you know because so far they many would not declare what they have but now they are forced to declare and just between november and now i have had a lot of litigations that have got settled okay that is in a with a more uh, educated uh, let's say privileged section of women now yes if you're uh, asking me whether the state is patriarchy of course the state is and frankly you know the state does not i don't think the state really cares for these kind of litigations you can see the fatigue with the judges which is also judiciary which is also representative of the state and in if any of you here are practicing in family law you know for a fact that the judges often tell you why don't you settle and come back you know now i i may not call the judge at that stage state but that is a fatigue uh, maybe with the excess litigation a reluctance to handle family matters a uh, a uh, a psychological feeling about your own experiences that judge the issue before you you know a host of other complexities emerge and especially you know let me give you an example of cruelty physical cruelty if you have evidence it's easy to prove everybody understands that but mental cruelty is virtually impossible and most of the time and uh, 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 you know i'll uh, the, i'm going a little away from your question of settlement but i'll tell you what happens i also feel that there is a age bias and discrimination in our legal system if a woman in her 50s or 60s after bringing up all her children maybe with the support of her children decide to break a bad marriage the immediate response of the counselors in the family courts or of everyone is if you have lived for so long why don't you tolerate it's far greater when the person is older okay and then secondly uh, the idea or the notion of condonation in our personal laws in the statutes what is condonation i have had examples where you know on the basis of condonation the case has been dismissed even though mental cruelty has been proved 
you know where the judges have held you have lived for so far you have condoned all the acts actually i even went to the extent of arguing in some saying now that the domestic violence act reg right, does not recognize all these things this idea of motion of condemnation ought not to be there taking note of the fact that the woman has come to court after so many years because only now she could you know have a support no you live there for so many years why don't you continue to live anyone if you all have handled uh, uh litigation with the older couple the wife will be given this advice you know so this is a problem you see in more ways than one on the issue of settlement uh yes settlement can be seen as uh you know if you really feel that there has to be a justice and there has to be a trial there has to be a finding you don't want to settle the judgment will not the litigation doesn't stop at that first level no if you go through a whole trial and even if you win the respondent the husband will take it up to the high court and how many years are you going to fight there so therefore you know settlement is always seen as an option to just come away from facing this process so i would say not just patriarchy but the entire structural problems that we have in our system are to blame i'm um, since you um i'll just uh, sonali if you don't have any question right now i just wanted to ask ma'am something and then maybe you can ask your question so follow up uh, because we had this question yes. in mind yes maybe about uh, you know as in you have mentioned that it is a uh, given that the state is patriarchal uh, and since that day you had a tooth ache maybe you can speak today about how the state intervenes um uh, with laws like anti conversion coming in and laws like? such as anti conversion triple talaq bill uh and though there's marriage act but there are different things that are coming and uh, i heard your uh, talk regarding the law in terms of how uh, personal laws change the way marriage and family law is looked at because then every every religion comes with their own sets of yeah and you said that while islam is good in terms of its paper the paper the practice or the the implementation of it was very ruthless so probably you could how the state intervenes in in way of all laws and um, another something that i wanted to ask you is on a feminist perspective and maybe we can ask it towards the end okay let me give you some very very common examples but we may laugh at it now before i go to your question on the religious laws now we know for a fact i'll tell you whatever we can say about the neutrality of the law um custom and practices have a huge role in in a marriage and i mean not just customs of rituals at the time of marriage but the understanding of how a person should be once the woman gets married in a different household okay like you don't wear your bindi you don't wear your mangal sutra you should wear a sari okay you should wear only this and i'm i there was a client of mine who was uh, uh, you know in her community the mangal sutra that they wear is very solid gold okay so she never wore that in the cross examination the lawyer asked her have you worn it today she said no uh therefore you don't care for your husband that's the inference because you know in the southern part of um, india in moso in tamil nadu also but i think in all other states the tying of the mang of the thali we say it in tamil the tying of the mangal sutra is a very 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 um important ritual and it's uh, you know huge social norms on what it means like if you throw it away then it's a big issue television movies everything talk about that in a very big way so in the next case and this is something i'm just sharing with you in the next case i knew that this would so the judge actually passed an order saying that he never cared blah 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 now in the next case 
when the client was coming to me every day in the court, I told her, listen, you may face a question about why you're not wearing your Mangal Sutra, so wear it and come for the cross-examination. <laughs> so she wore and came. In the cross-examination, true to his form, this different lawyer asked her, have you worn it? So she took it out and showed him like this, you know. So <laughs> he said, oh, but you have worn it only because of today and your lawyer may have told you to wear it. So she said, don't know, I always wear it. So this, see how the cross-examination goes. This is, and you cannot control the cross-examination. After all, anybody, a lawyer has a right to ask anything. This is a customary practice which he's asking to indicate that you have not cared for any of these customs, etc. Okay. I don't know how much... Uh, uh, Mang Mang Me Sindur maybe is as a, is very important. So maybe questions relating to that would also be asked. Okay. Then we may think again that this is absurd. Now litigants may come and say uh, black magic has been done. Jadu Tona, the other side has done. How do you frame that in the in the pleading? So we'll tell them, no, no, this can't be put in a pleading. Maybe what you say is true because you can't, you know, the feelings are very important. You have to actually validate the feeling of a person who's sitting before you who really believes that this is the problem. You may not believe in that at all. So no, no, you can't put that in the pleading because you can't prove in a court of law that it requires no evidence, etc. But the fact is that the judge who's presiding over that may also believe in the in the things like Jadu Tonang. You see how how challenging it is. I'm not even, you know, I find that understanding and boxing emotions is the greatest challenge that is posed in family law. Box, boxing emotions within the framework of law is its greatest challenge. So, I'm giving you an idea about how these customs vary with every, maybe village to village, whatever. So now, when you ask me about the conversion bill, a conversion ordinance, and also on the triple talaq law. See, I personally think that when there are so many issues, see, essentially, um, under current, in the current Hindu law, and Child Marriage Restraint Act has been challenged in the in Delhi High Court, I think, the make which which says that these are voidable marriages, right? So marriages below the age of eighteen uh, of a woman is only voidable. That is, unless she goes to court and says that it is null and void, it's a valid marriage. All religious laws look at it as valid marriage. But if a young girl at seventeen and a half, let's say, leaves the home. Let's look at minors. Then we look at adults. Leaves the home. Let's stay, say that this young 17 and a half is a worker. She is financially independent it, at her own level. You know, she maybe is a domestic help. She's capable of earning her own income. And she exercises the choice to marry. Her husband will be charged under POXO because she's 17 and a half. Because POXO treats all kinds of sexual contact of those below the age of 18 as an offense. Including maybe if you hug and hold your hand, that also is a form of offense under POXO. Any person can give a complaint against you. So that's the difficulty you have even of exercising a choice. Now, for majors, when the law permits you to exercise your choice, here is a law, here is where the state really comes through. The power of the state is coming and saying, no, 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 we want to verify whether you're converting on your own accord. What kind of power and what kind of uh, uh, aggression the state can use? Can you imagine a young 19-year-old who is 19-year-old and a 22-year-old make a choice? Maybe the choice is bad, you know, maybe that at that age you should not marry. Those are all our views. Anybody can have that view, but the oppressive hand of the state will say, if it is an inter-religious marriage, 
no 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 you come now before the uh, before the collector and tell him whether the whether it's legal or not and this one month and three months notice that the special marriage act requires also you know uh, um, um, resist people from um, marrying under that because you have to first show your proof of address for a month living in that place and then only anyone can raise an objection you, you know uh, when ayom sharmila got married in kodaikanal you know the activist she got married in kodaikanal some stranger raised an objection saying she should not be allowed to marry there because she will cause some kind of a problem now what kind of law is this special marriage act doesn't permit you to have a interreligious marriage unless you give one month notice and then if you really decide to convert and have a form of marriage then there is a state that says no you should not marry so we have really criminalized the right to choice in very very strong ways okay now islamic law uh, the triple talaq has been a problem for a very long time and that there is a legislation that has now forbidden triple talaq in my opinion has actually empowered in my own experience a lot of muslim women uh, who are now you know using that to take uh, whatever recourse but the politics of that law is very problematic and the fact that you see the difficulty i have with that law is that why should it be that you go to a police to file a private to file a complaint you know if they i felt that in that legislation you know just like you have offenses against marriage in the ipc bigamy now adultery is not an offense but all other kinds of uh, offenses are there in all those cases you don't go to the court you go you don't go to the police you go to the magistrate by way of a private complaint so like defamation also you go to the magistrate by way of private complaint this legislation would have actually made it like that instead of that it has made it a uh, 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 it has made it much more it has criminalized it more and you need to go to the police to file a complaint why should that law have been like that that is a very big problem having already the supreme court having already declared that triple talaq was void the legislation i think was just a political tool it was not didn't take note of the other issues that actually affect muslim women absolutely right ma'am that's my view people may have different views we had a follow up to that but now you said that you have an issue with the politics of it what was your follow up on the politics <laughs> oh, yeah i i had just uh, one like you know i think that uh, even when you become graded uh, as a dalit or as a muslim man also you are in a way being seen in a very othered form by the state so to criminalize i think it's my opinion and i may get a lot of that for that but i think that it is also we at looking at the muslim man as the criminalized person of course very much so that is why that is why the um, you know and you know let me put it that way there are many other issues you know, in islamic law it's not just uh, uh, you know it's not just this and you know you talk about wanting to change islamic law who would want to change huf would anybody want to change the idea of how businesses are big businesses are held as huf yeah so when you are talking of a uniform civil code what are the areas there are many very interesting things about islamic law also no inheritance you cannot uh, will away one third so therefore you cannot disinherit your heirs you know and and i think uh, the the way it was practiced in india was extremely problematic but in the understanding of divorce uh, islamic law really looked at marriage as a contract and looked at the divorce as a breakdown so the notion of talaq is actually based on the breakdown theory of marriage the irretrievable breakdown theory of marriage and when the when islamic law came the other laws really treated marriage as a sacrament except customary hindu law among other communities which recognized divorce 
Christian law looked at marriage as a sacrament. You couldn't come out. Uh, maybe Protestants would manage to do etc. But by and large, it was very difficult to come out of a marriage. Whereas Islamic law looked at it more as a contractual obligation. That it was discriminatory, that's a different issue. But you know, to actually um, bring it like that, as if that's the, it has, the politics of it is very problematic. Absolutely, ma'am. I just, I wanted to touch a little upon your journey, how it has been um, being a woman in litigation, the challenges, the struggles uh, that you must have faced that you think uh, had not been there had you been maybe a man, let's say, or, you know, uh, if there's any blatant or even subtle discrimination that you felt and how you dealt with it, how, how you made your mark um any any anything you'd like to share with us regarding that okay see uh, when i joined the profession women were not there in such large numbers and uh, i was fortunate to have joined the uh, office i joined the office of mr g ram Swami, who later on became the attorney general of india that time he was practicing in chennai i joined his office and uh, fortunately for me, in the office, I did not see discrimination. Okay. Discrimination on the basis of gender. We would have a lot of tensions of different types. But at that time, there were many offices in Chennai, especially very many senior lawyers, who would not take a woman as a junior. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so now the situation has changed to such a large extent that many offices ask for a woman junior because they feel that you know there's more responsibility women lawyers are showing more interest etc i'm talking about the seniors okay the the other point that i actually want to share with you is that uh, i did a lot of legal aid work okay uh, tamil nadu had a very robust legal aid system before the legal services authority and uh, we were all encouraged a lot to do a lot of cases, especially in criminal law, in prisons, in the juvenile system, uh, in, uh, you know, the women's shelter, etc. And, and PIL. So a large part of our litigations actually were encouraged. And my ex entire experience on criminal law in, the, in my early stages in the bar came by doing legal aid cases because nobody would actually trust me with a, a criminal case like that. You know, you could only be. And so that, I think, was a, uh, not just me, a lot of women and even young men who, you know, who, would not, who, don't, who did not have the opportunity of joining big offices got that. Okay. So that was the how this came through. But if you're looking, if you're asking me about discrimination, I'll say it, it operates in various ways. I think one is that... Um, it takes a long time, especially when you are young, for the court to accept you seriously. Okay. Secondly, what you say, and if the same thing is said by a man, has a different meaning. Okay. So say, for example, a, a, a man cracks a joke. Everybody laughs in a court. But if the woman were to crack a joke, then you don't know how it is going to be taken. Okay. So these are ways of a different type which operate. Then, of course, once you start... Uh, so I would say that we have to work much harder. Okay. Everything about your body language, everything about the way you dress, everything is noticed. You know, how you... Um, so, we... Well, everything is a freedom of expression. Your dressing, how you, what you do is a freedom of expression. But in the courtroom, it becomes a structure. What to be, I think, conscious of that, at least for the first few years. Then once you are known... You know, then whatever you do, uh, people, I mean, whatever you do, whatever you do well, 
that is appreciation. The first few years, it's really, really important to make a mark in terms of how you are, which is not so necessary for a man. Absolutely. So there is this discrimination that operates. For me as a woman, when I have done, when I earlier, when I had done custody cases, you know, sometimes the judges have joked, oh, you're not married, you don't know what it is. Okay. And that has happened. Uh, you don't know whether to react with anger because everybody is watching you for your reaction or you don't know whether to laugh it off. But depending upon your personality, people may react differently. Temperamentally, I don't lose my temper much. Though I will see the inside if somebody were to say this. But the issue is that, would this have been asked to a man? If he was defending a, a custody case. I mean, if he was doing a custody case. Because there, then the idea would be that, um, you know, you... Um, he needs to take care of his family, etc. Okay. So, I mean, uh, very, very interesting issues come up, even in conversations sometimes. And this is even with male lawyers. I remember once, you know, a male lawyer asked me, oh, why do you have to earn your single? You know, implying that, you know, there is no future generation, etc. So I told him, I told him this time, of course, I was much older. So I told him by that yardstick, most of the senior lawyers in the country should stop working because they have made money for 10 generations. <laughs> you know, why do you have to work? Sorry, not done. Why do you have to work? So, you know, this kind of um, silly comments, which are actually very irritating at one level, to direct hostility, uh, which can happen when you're... Um, you know, uh, actually facing somebody. I've had a lot of instances of direct hostility also. Um, can be very, very difficult to bear. So, whereas I think a woman would never show this direct hostility to a man, male lawyer on the basis that he's a man. Absolutely, ma'am. Also, in my experience, uh, like I shared with you, it's been uh, men are somehow seen to be more sturdy. So they can do all the running around with the files and mm -hmm. women are considered to be okay more apt for taking uh, for being a mediator or a counselor when it comes to family law matters and nothing more than that. And when you say you want to do more, you're actually seen as somebody who said something that's out of her reach. And um, I, I remember my previous boss, my senior, he was a, a, a very good senior otherwise. But one day he just sat me down and he said that, why are you getting so tensed over this? You'll just get married one day and leave the country maybe and get settled abroad with a rich husband. So there's nothing more that you you know need or want. So these these little, little things and that you're absolutely right, ma'am. At that point, you don't know whether you should just laugh it off or you should make, make some tenor. noise. <laughs> <laughs> now, because you know, I'll tell you something again. If we, if you, if the woman makes a noise, she'll be seen as hysterical. Yeah. It's only the woman who will be seen as hysterical, not a man who shouts. Absolutely, ma'am. That's why you know, in, when women clients come and they are seething with anger at their spouse, I tell them, don't lose your temper. Be calm. Don't look at him. Look at the judge or look at me or my juniors, because. If you lose your temper at him, and he will never lose his temper in the at the wife because they, I mean, very well conditioned, you know, to be proper and to say he's the best person in the world. I'll tell them because if you lose your temper, it's for her a bottled up pent up emotion. But the judge will think if you can shout like this in court, how would you have treated him at home? So I always tell them never to lose your temper. That then becomes oh. mental cruelty for some reason. Yeah, could be. And it, it works in the mind of the court that you would have treated him badly. So I always tell them, then don't look at him. Absolutely. You know, it takes a lot to actually see these kind of subtle uh, ways in which uh, patriarchy operates within the legal system. I mean, you take a rape case, for example. I remember uh, I've done a lot of uh, matters uh, supporting survivors. 
legal system calls them victims. We don't understand the term survivors at all. And there you will find two, three issues. One is that the woman has to, you know, the under the IPC, especially the pre-Nirbhaya amendment. And in the Evidence Act, anyway, you have to describe in detail what happened to you. You have to describe that penetrative act. Now, if you describe that in detail, the subtle psychological, it's very subtle, that can operate in the mind of the judges. You can talk about this openly in this fora. What kind of a person are you? It's very subtle. Okay. So if you can, as a woman, if you can talk about this very openly, what kind of a woman would you be? You know, especially now. Supposing you don't talk at all. You're too shy. You're embarrassed. You're a very private person. You don't like to talk about these things. What operates in the mind, the defense will take up that as an issue and say, she did not even speak about the act. Therefore, it did not occur. It becomes a very, very difficult process, you know. Um, you have to actually uh, sit with the person. At least that's what I have done. I've sat with them for days beforehand, telling them what to answer, telling them that your answers have to be short, telling them don't expand your answers because the more you expand, the, the other side <coughs> will take lots of questions from them. Telling them not to look at the defense lawyer because the moment the eye contact is established, then you know you get afraid. Look at the judge and answer. That's how the whole... Um, now, no prosecutor will ever tell a, a person that because for a prosecutor, you're just a witness, come and go. And that's why I feel that there should be greater intervention in many of these matters by, you know, um, people, women, now the law permits you to actually participate a little more, but take through the process in a much greater way. Right. Um, I, this reminds me, this, yeah, can I, so this reminds me of Pratiksha Bakshi's, uh, which one? Pratiksha Bakshi's uh, public sectors of law and uh, how the medical examination is done. And we actually wanted to have her in this webinar, but she was not doing well. Uh, but I really think that, you know, this has to be detailed or maybe further going further, we can talk about it. And uh, on the same, uh, uh, as in now that we're on the same topic, there is a question by Pavana Roy. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to hear from you regarding the latest approach by the SC, where they asked the accused to marry the rape victim? Do you think marriage is a solution to the rape? Of course not. Don't you think that the judiciary have failed to protect the right? Do you think? What's the third part of the question? Do you think that it is a solution to rape? Definitely not. How can it be? You know? See, and uh, we all know um, relationships and we all know what is rape. And to ask in a case of this nature, you know, especially by the Supreme Court that actually validates what many trial courts are doing. They've been fighting. It's only in the trial courts earlier that these questions used to come. Now that more or less, I think at least in, I, I hear it is stopping because of a lot of protests on that issue. But if the Supreme Court asks a question like that, what do we have to say? Here we are asking for... Uh, for uh, asking for the system to understand marital rape, okay, um, sexual abuse under the DV Act. Marital rape can often be construed as a sexual abuse under the DV Act. It, can, it is often taken to be that there's so much of violence sometimes, it's a form of physical cruelty. So when these things are emerging in the privacy of a marital relationship, how can the court even ask that, you know, why would you marry her? The, I mean, I have not, I don't know what to say because I'm very, not anything else, I'm really saddened by how the 
chief justice has made that comment there is no way that one can even accept that you know and i'm so glad that so many of us have actually protested about it as a follow especially in a poxo case yes ma'am <clears throat> the skin to skin transmit accused was a adult she was a minor i just ma'am as a follow up to that uh, babita had asked a question and i was thinking about this too that ma'am there are only 80 women judges out of total sanctioned strength of 1113 judges in the high court and the supreme court across india out of these 80 women judges there are only two in the supreme court and the other 78 are in various high courts comprising only 7.2% of the total number of judges but there are many females in law field not in judiciary um uh, she wanted to ask uh, what your uh, what your opinion on that is and i wanted to uh, ask that do you think if we had more women judges uh, would that change the nature of uh, judgments and the precedents that are being set and the the comments and the opinions that are being made because somehow male judges lack that understanding that sensitivity or i definitely feel that there has to be more much more women judges than what we have now okay now what we call as there has to be a critical mass of uh, women judges the way we used to talk about the 33% litigation of a 33% reservation by a critical mass of women in the legislature okay but now, having said that uh, in terms of uh, in terms of us to accept whether uh, merely because we have women judges uh, uh, better judgments will come i'm not so sure because if you look at trial court some of the trial court judgments especially the ones that came from uh, backpur on poxo you know uh, Uh, where you know actually you find that uh, <coughs> the judgments that you all can hear me yes can you hear yeah yes sir. yeah the judgments that came from poxo from the nagpur bench of the bombay high court three acquittals if you remember that recently three acquittals on three days with absurd reasoning you know so therefore it's not as if if you have a it's not as if women judges alone will give better judgments will be better sensitive because they can come from the same patriarchal mold but you need to have greater women judges to improve the critical mass in terms of representation of women in the judiciary hmm. absolutely ma'am does that answer her question also to me it does i'll ask uh, babita babita you can write in the chat box if you have any follow up to that uh, sonali i believe you had a follow up question if you're there sonali okay uh while she comes back uh, babita has said uh, ma'am in our country no law is related to marital rape but as we see that if anyone makes sexually sexual relations with his wife so it is not under rape another somebody else has also asked your opinion on bringing laws uh, making marital rape uh, a crime yeah well we have to wait we still have restitution of conjugal rights as a law no <laughs> and that is a little absurd having that in our system even though of course the state can't force you to join it can you know it doesn't really idea is not right Right. There's one interesting question in the chat box which says have you heard statements like you are not a man you will not understand the burden or responsibility to look after your family I just gave you some examples of a man asking me why do you have to earn right <laughs> that was one classic instance but I also want to tell you that it is very hard I'm sure if uh, many of you are coming from the uh, districts very hard for women to practice in districts and in smaller trial courts easier much easier for us in the in the city or in an urban area you know and that's why a large number of young women lawyers who are from you know whose uh, home towns are uh, outside do come and practice in the city where they feel that it is much 
more challenging and interesting because rural area um, a the bar is a little hostile b the confidence of the litigant public on you will take a long time and therefore the the judges should also encourage you in that but they may not do something that i wanted to uh, understand from you was also uh, i'm sure that you have your own kind of feminism and i think we all have our <laughs> kind of feminism. so i wanted to understand from you the idea of capital punishment um i don't know if i can say this but i feel like that uh, in at least in terms of prisons while we should focus on restitution we focus on retribution uh when in marriage uh we should like probably be more a more uh, you know assertive in terms of just the separation if it's too much uh then we try to uh you know get them back together we try to solve the equation we don't the sanctimonious uh strength of the marriage uh as um, what do you think what are your thoughts on capital punishment i asked this because in rape cases when ms indra jaisen had asked nirbhas mother to forgive the rapist uh then uh i mean there was a huge backlash against her but there's also a feminist way of looking at capital punishment and i think her reference to the idea of uh you know forgiving them was more from the point of view of restitution probably i'm not sure but this is how i interpret it see i am personally against capital punishment so my political view on that is there should be no capital punishment okay. and uh, i think in the entire region nepal is the only country that has actually abolished capital punishment and uh, you know earlier on there were a strong um, and if you are any one of you are interested in knowing more about that there is a very interesting amnesty international report called lethal lottery uh, lethal lottery which talks about how capital punishment analyzes various judgments of the supreme court and uh, talks about how uh, poverty and not having good legal representation and various other socio economic factors like you know uh, being underprivileged being dalit uh being uh, not being of any majoritarian caste or you know religion uh result in greater capital punishment it's uh, in judgments the study has actually analyzed various judgments it has also analyzed judgments where the evidence is very sketchy and where it is felt that capital punishment ought not to be it's a very interesting uh, study so now i personally think i am against the idea of capital punishment so i can't say that just you know and there's no way i will say that uh, like in in a huge violent case even if it is like say near by us the accused should be given capital punishment and my own when you are against capital punishment then there is no new there is absolutely it's an absolute position from which i come from now um your uh, point in terms of uh, what was your second point you said uh, uh the feminist position of as an if as a feminist yeah okay uh, when uh, soumya verma has asked no capital punishments even for rape i uh, yes <laughs> there are so many heinous so I mean the rarest of the rare is how the court has to actually analyze capital punishment but uh, you know what does it serve and on this i wanted to tell you there are you know in every scenario there is what is called as uh, there is a due diligence uh, theory on what should be and it's called the four p's you know p and the four p's are that prevention protection prosecution punishment okay punishment is the last measures to prevent and protect okay uh, which can also include education see ideas of sexuality problems of the uh, uh, you know understanding the difference between sexuality and sexual violence is almost nil in our country so uh, prevention and protection 
need to be stressed stressed upon but no what we are actually jumping is to go to the punishment moment there is a heinous violence everybody shouts for the punishment it's much easy for us to shout for punishment without addressing these three you know and that's something uh, we actually need to uh, look into see um, i'm just looking at the chat box see for example somebody has asked me about what is the punishment as an attackers rapists etc see your um, um, you can have even complete life in prison then there's no problem with that anyway rape by itself under our law also doesn't have capital punishment it's only when it is done in a very different heinous form does it and you know does it uh, inculcate the uh, does it entertain the idea of capital punishment nor is acid attack uh, something that is given not does acid attack have capital punishment as a sentence you know so uh, so it's i think uh, you can actually address this in a far different way and you can always have a lot of miscarriage you can never be certain of that in the indian context um so collective conscience is often you know often used when saying that the collective conscience of the entire country is shocked it is beyond them to understand so i know that uh, this is the way that judgments especially for capital punishment and i think project 39 is also doing really i mean amazing work on punishment um afzal guru yeah that's where the theory of theory of collective consciousness, collective consciousness came came from i don't think a court should actually look into collective consciousness it should actually look into the evidence it should actually look into what is there before the court it should actually look into the statement of the accused it can actually look into all other issues before it says that um you know whatever sentence it gives to the accused but if you talk about collective consciousness it's very very problematic because this was a parliament attack case so yes the nation's uh, anger was there very much okay but uh, you can use that for every other case no every other case can be an issue of collective consciousness and argue that this is a case which must get the maximum punishment so putting that as a theory in criminal law is is i think to my mind problematic i you have a follow up question is there now huh yeah hmm? uh, doesn't capital punishment has the highest deterrence effect no it does not so mia because studies you know um, there are many studies that show how do, can, have you ever seen it deter anybody the increasing crime rate in india just take the number of uh, sexual assault and murder let's say everybody knows that there is capital punishment that you can go you know you can be hanged but has it ever deterred studies have shown that it doesn't deter at all you know the deterrence is not uh, it, it doesn't come much i think the problem with the indian uh, punishments are that we are still uh, uh, we are still confused between the reformative theory and the deterrent theory at one level you feel that there has to be reformation of the person who commits the crime you have open air prisons you look at employment opportunities prisoners are expected to you know like tihar for example has a whole lot of programs for prisoners you are looking at reformation another level so this this conflict is existing in very many ways right um and um i just wanted to say like you talked about the four p's and we usually skip skip the first three and we go to punishment straight because i also think personally that that's the easy way out and that's why there's been really no change because you just uh you you try to get rid of it yeah uh, sorry ma'am i your yeah, voice I was hear. breaking i got yes. distracted with the chat box yeah yeah uh, i i just can you repeat it 
Yes, ma'am. I I tend to agree with you. I feel like that's the easy way out because uh, if we really want to bring about a change, we'll have to practice a lot. We'll have it. It's harder to work on that. I I, I personally believe that, and so the reformation will happen if we try to really get to the root of the problem instead of trying to just get rid of it the moment we see. And there's this concept of collective consciousness, and we just want to give them what they want at that point, and then it repeats, and then. you just repeat what you did before and this it's just a vicious circle um that's what i think oh, and you know we don't <laughs> notice what happens to the family of the survivor or a victim if she's dead what happens to them what is the role of the state in her empowerment right i don't think we have not i mean i don't even know whether there are systematic studies on that in the indian context have we followed up who you know what women have been doing in their lives because we are also afraid of intruding on the privacy but isn't that a role of a state you know that uh, how do we actually then see what has been the difference you know what can happen to their family maybe in some you know so that's something again we actually need to think a lot about you know which is goes beyond the area of punishment absolutely ma'am uh, ma'am safa had asked you a question uh, that you just told us how you tell your client not to lose their temper uh, in matrimonial cases and cross examination i would like to know your experience if you have any as an advocate how you handle your temper when you're handling cases of rape and sexual abuse when you as a woman know that your counselor exceeded his limits while cross examination of your client uh, and i would like to add to that when you know for a fact if you are defending somebody who you know is guilty okay I'll, who who i have never defended a accu a person accused of rape wow wow and right. that has been that has been one of my uh, one principle of mine i've never filed a petition to assist somebody and i am not saying of course everybody is entitled to a lawyer i have no i mean you know that's the that that right one recognizes but personally i have not done that okay now how do you how do i keep myself from i i have lost my temper in a couple of instances not that i have not lost and uh, what really happens i'll tell you uh, um in terms of losing temper and shouting not just is necessarily in a rape case but just as a court graph see the judge feels pressured when two lawyers shout at each other okay and uh, it it then then you know the the litigation goes in a little bit of a different direction because then you are fighting and calling each other whatever names etc now uh yes it is a very very difficult uh, issue because cross examination especially of a now family law most of it if there are family courts are done in chambers and in those places where there is where the family courts act doesn't exist and order 39 cpc is not followed where the judge has to give you privacy or there's no space there are sometimes open court cross examinations and cross examinations can really be nasty when it is something to do with the sexual intimacy now your uh, the aspect of it works out in two ways you have to prepare the witness for those kind of questions very very important you have to prepare the witness for those questions you have to tell her that they will ask you all kinds of questions earlier on they used to ask about the character with other men now after that you know after i joined the bar and when the amendment to the evidence act came that stopped after mathras case but those uh, uh, questions are very very difficult i also tell them two things that your role as a witness is to be convincing to the judge well the lawyer who asks these kind of silly questions is playing to the gallery he does it like a you know you, you know most uh, uh, he does it and if you see these lawyers when they ask those kind of questions they'll turn around and look at others you know 
they look at the rest of the other ha ha karke you know oh, so that's playing to the gallery therefore uh, now i if i'm assisting i'm not i have never been a prosecutor for rape cases so i cannot do a direct cross examination i cannot also intervene by objecting to the questions asked so i developed i uh, the prosecutors you have you have to develop a relationship with them so that you can tell them to object to these questions okay first stage you can say this is a unnecessary question immediately but the defense lawyer will say she has no business to ask or intervene so you know to avoid that kind you can ask the prosecutor to object and then when he makes a objection the judge can record so or sometimes smart judges will themselves say these are unnecessary irrelevant questions that is why the witness should look at the judge and answer or if it is getting typed or keyed into a computer and the computers before you look at that if you are able to read it it's that eye contact once the defense lawyer gets your eye contact then you know he's had you of course you can't avoid but at least if you make a if you advise the witness this um, you know maybe one there will be one eye contact then after that you you know for the second third question you go back to looking at the court very hard to control cross uh, these kind of uh, bad questions let me put it in the court hall but uh, you you have i i don't do i have lost my temper earlier now you know it just you know that this is how it's going to be but nevertheless you know that is something we need to understand how the trial processes work should there be gender sensitization classes yes for men lawyers and judges judges of course there are lots of courses run by the judicial academy etc but <clears throat> uh, issue is important and about awareness through education about sexuality yes i think slowly we are emerging there maybe it will take some more maybe it will take a long time maybe it will take some time but at least we are discussing L imagine the usage of words like sexuality at least is being discussed 20 years ago we would not have used it that reminds me of hidatullah <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and uh, there is a question which is um, which was asked by uh, in the q and a by natasha agarwal i think you will like this question because uh, it talks about formal equality uh, a society as patriarchal as ours where the female gender has not been treated inclusively do you think existence of gender neutral legislations will help making the system a bit more inclusive for example in context of same sex marriage or even sexual assault or rape committed by women or anyone not identifying as a cis man would love to know your opinion in this my opinion in this regard what is the first half of the question because i can't see it here uh, it says that a society as patriarchal patriarchal as ours where the female gender has not been treated inclusively do you think existence of gender neutral legislations will help making the system a bit more inclusive uh gender specific legislations or gender neutral the specific legislation you know uh depending upon the area in which you operate for example you know if you take hindu law both the man the man can also claim maintenance from you maintenance and alimony from the wife this is based on a formal equality process but uh, actually the ground reality is something else right in terms of how what is women's role what she does etc and uh, they, therefore that's a very whereas all other legislations fortunately don't have that as uh, people will of course ask today the woman is earning well why can't she pay but that's not the ground reality because you know that once this provision is there people can make all kinds of demands on you in terms of same sex marriage i don't know whether you all have um, heard of the judgment of the madras high court the madurai bench which has said that under section under the hindu law the hindu law talks only about marriages of 
Hindus. It doesn't talk about a male and a female. And the court legitimized and directed the registrar of marriages to register the marriages of two transgenders. Okay, so that's a very interesting judgment uh, in terms of the evolution of this uh, process. And uh, 377, of course, is still new, new ideas are all coming there, but uh, we have to now see how it goes through. Okay. Hopefully, the court will accept. Uh, I think, you know, it again depends upon the various states. We find that in the southern states, there is a greater understanding of uh, um, uh, transgender rights and cis rights, etc. For example, in Karnataka, if you want to change your gender, you, uh, you just have to file an affidavit before the concerned authorities and make the change. In Tamil Nadu, it's a little more difficult. So these kind of changes have come. I don't know how it is in other states. So I think that will start the process. But yes, civil rights, namely rights that flow from marriage, divorce, custody, uh, inheritance, etc., do not are not available for uh, cis persons. You know, because the law hasn't legitimized it as yet. It only decriminalized 377, but other rights that flow has not come in as yet. We were looking if we could get NCRB data on trans violence that happens against transgender, mm -hmm. but I don't think that has been included as yet. And, uh, also, I think we need to maybe um, do studies to understand whether, uh, especially you know, when there is violence, the first call would be the police, right? So whether police understand this in the first place, because if they do, then we, you know, goes off in a different way. Uh, um, Dr. V. Sundaresan has asked, ma'am, uh, have come across judge gets wild during the time of advocates' arguments. If a lawyer loses his or her temper, does it come under contempt of court? No, I mean, losing temper doesn't come under contempt of court, but then it also depends upon the judge. I mean, I've uh, seen, uh, you know, judges just getting angry and threatening to use the contempt law against a particular advocate where the, the lawyer has been very, very uh, rude and, you know, in some ways, I have seen that as an example. But, you know, sometimes contempt is used for some very um, strange reasons. Like recently, the Madras High Court, in a case where a lawyer was actually sitting in his car and appearing online, you know, and obviously, you know, online courts, most of us, most people may not have a structured, uh, uh, you know, setup, may not have very good communication. And suddenly when your case is called, you talk through the phone. He was actually very proper, dressed in court uniform. He had a client or someone sitting behind him and the judge said, no, no, you are disrespectful. You are sitting in a car and talking. That is not the way you should do. You have committed contempt. So contempt has been taken to absurd, absurd lengths uh, in the way in which uh, courts are actually looking at the law. And so, so I think um, that that was one example I wanted to give you to, for the question to show that, you know, there was no rationale at all. It was not even as if the lawyer was being rude. Right. Plainly, if a lawyer loses his temper, it doesn't come, unfortunately, under the contempt of court. Contempt of court depends upon each judge, what, it, what he thinks about what has happened. And therefore, it's a very personalized, emotional approach to what the judge perceives as an insult to him and therefore an insult to the institution. Wow. I think uh, some of it is too persuasion also. No, sedition becomes a bit different. No, sedition, you know, actually the sedition, uh, sedition is very peculiar. In this earlier cases, if you see the earlier, early cases of sedition, complaints were only filed by the government and actually for two, 
prosecute a sedition case at a subsequent time at the stage of charge sheet, you need the sanction of the government. So why should everyone go to the police and say, I've committed sedition? Who are they to assess what is seditious and what is not? Because especially in the context of freedom of speech, how do you assess that? You know, I find what you say is wrong. I don't like what you say. Therefore, I've, you have committed sedition. It's so, a, the number of cases that are being entertained is a total waste of time, apart from harassment, of course. That goes without saying. So in actuality, in practicality, um, when we talk about objectivity and unbiasedness or having just <laughs> detached yourself from the entire situation and taking a fair decision, that, that actually is very hard for like it's very hard to exist in reality. Oh, I right. think freedom of expression, matrimonial law, they are all matters of highly they are they are matters of highly subjective nature. Mm -hmm. There's hardly any objectivity in it. Depending upon what you think, you may think that there is nothing in this book. Somebody else may think that this is the most horrible book and the writer needs to be put behind bars. So where's the objectivity? You can never have objectivity for freedom of expression. It's highly... Is it, is the Same too, I think, with matrimonial law also in the pleadings. You know? yes. Yes. It's always... Uh, cruelty is always subjective to the opinion of the judge. Yes, ma'am. What he yes. thinks is right. Very well put, ma'am. Very well Um... So we have a couple of questions. We are actually uh, done with the time for the yeah, questions. Yeah, uh, time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we still have a couple of questions. Ma'am, if you could just spare five minutes. Yeah, uh, we know ma'am is extremely busy and despite her tight schedule at such short notice, she made time for us to be yeah. here. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. It's been a cathartic experience for me and I am sure for Sonali as well. And we, we do have uh, a couple of questions. I think I'll just take some of them and maybe the rest we can, um, you know, ask you to just send Thank across you. to us and we'll, we'll get in touch with ma'am yeah. and maybe discuss them uh, in another session somehow. Uh, so, uh, Himanshi has asked, under which council is it good to practice, either male and female, uh, if you're uh, just starting out? Uh, if, you, if you're starting out as a female litigator and you don't really know so is it better to practice under a male senior or a female senior <laughs> I don't know it I think you need to practice with a good senior <laughs> right out around a bit and find out which lawyer has matters subject to your interest you know friends can always tell you your classmates can always tell you and right. uh, maybe if, and also it's your comfort level. If you're comfortable more with a woman senior, fine. If mm -hmm. you think a male senior is better, fine. Right. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am Nidhi has asked, uh, I would want to hear ma'am's opinion on the condition of incarcerated women and their children. And also how successful the criminal justice system has been to address the issues and challenges faced by these women. That's a big question. Anyway, let me try to answer that in a big way. Uh, there is a lot of, um, you know, in many prisons, actually, you might find physically there is a lot of, can be a lot of differences. For example, the men may have better, you know, televisions. They may have better uh, recreational uh, facilities available to them. Uh, the women may have much less and you know men may have better opportunities to educate themselves you know there are prisons where people are actually doing their phd right and uh, for women uh, because the women may generally have to start from a very uh, lower level of education because generally by and large women prisoners prisoners themselves are not very uh, Unless, you know, they are, as by and large prison system deals with a lot of poverty, people in poverty and with the intersection of other caste, religion, etc. So now, 
you so then uh, there are couple of studies on uh, there have been some litigations addressing women prisoners okay even the cases pertaining to sheila barse early cases of 1980 1980s and recently there has been a couple of studies on the condition of women prisoners in terms of what has been their infrastructure etc but between a man and a woman you know when a woman comes out of a prison she really does not have a family to look forward to i have seen that in my own experience because for a man the woman still waits for him the wife and the family would still wait for him but not so in the case of a woman because once she is in jail invariably uh, there i have known instances where the man would just marry go away go away etc and she really has no one and then if she has children that child is also taken away by them so by being a victim of circumstances which have forced such women into the criminal justice system you have uh, the, you find that there is a great difference in the way men and women are treated yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am i i have made uh, we've recorded all the other questions we'll definitely try to get some more time from ma'am and uh, continue this conversation uh, but before we let you go ma'am uh, we just uh, wanted you to share with us anything that you think you should have known uh, like looking back when you started out uh, as a litigator and as a woman in this profession anything you wish you would have known then and any advice you have for our young litigators our young women everyone the younger generation coming behind you okay i know i can't tell you anything that i think you should know it's a very adventurous journey it's a very challenging sometimes it's a challenging frustrating adventurous journey uh, it is very fascinating because uh though it can be exhaustive and tiring every person who comes to you with whatever branch of law you decide to practice uh you can um you know will have a new problem and so every every litigation is a new issue it can never be the same so that way it is highly stimulating intellectually and you can never get tired so what i want to advise you is two things don't feel low because in the first few years if you are a litigator it's probably very difficult to make enough money okay it is a, in that sense a materially struggling profession and you can end up feeling frustrated that is why you need to join a fairly good office where you learn the ropes at least you know if you like that office you can stay there but you learn the ropes come out and then maybe along with friends join like a collective or a firm or whatever name you want to call it and start off your practice work will come there is ample work around it will definitely come to you all and therefore you need to um, just step into the waters stormy maybe but step into the waters and enjoy yourself wow thank you so much ma'am don't feel low thank you so much ma'am for thank such an enlightening session everyone has such nice things to say uh, dr janaki said thank you geeta ma'am good to see you all <laughs> thank Been you dr janaki i hope you're doing well uh yeah. your mass job satisfaction in 1992 mm. i hope yeah. your publication is available uh, dr janaki and if so if you could let us know let sania or sonali know i'd like to take a look at that yes please so thank you every very everyone and i really enjoyed this interaction uh, with you all and uh, i i found that the questions that you posed and the discussions were very very interesting and stimulating to me you know made me think a lot of other issues so thank you thank you so much ma'am so much ma'am thank you, you ma'am have a great day have a great have women's great. day all of you too we wish to get in touch with you soon again ma'am okay. i'm sure we'll have a follow up session we very soon <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yes. no, we're no, not no. done yet yeah. <laughs> we thank you thank you all yes. bye everybody bye sanya bye sonali thank you so much ma'am thank you, thank you.